Now, you young black brothers and sisters that are in your 20s and 30s, how many in the audience are 30 years old and younger? Okay. Now, you don't know what the older ones in here know about how bad it was to be black in America. You think now, because you can turn on your TV and look at a black man romancing a white woman, or you can turn on Oprah and see this beautiful woman with this most beautiful heart who's a billionaire. And when you see her, you say, oh, man, we have arrived. You see the great Judge Mathis holding court, coming out of the ghetto to rise now to a position of honor and respect. You see Shaquille O'Neal, Kobe Bryant. You see the great basketball players, football players, multimillionaires. And you say, oh boy, we're making it. America's all right. But I want to say to all of us who have a nice home, a nice car, a little money in the bank, some success. Do not allow yourself to be used. Listen, listen, listen. As a mannequin in the window of democracy to sell a lie to your poor brothers and sisters who are suffering in the ghettos of America. You cannot rise above the condition of your people. If our people are nothing, then how can Judge Mathis be something? If our people are nothing, how can Bill Cosby be something? If our people are nothing, how can Mayor Barry be something? You are a nigger that escaped, that they allowed to be who and what you are so that the masses will be deceived. Look at it. <clears throat> Muhammad Ali came and visited me recently. I was so glad to see my wonderful brother. But Muhammad Ali had a mantra that he kept saying, and I didn't understand it. He said, Brother Farrakhan, still a nigga. I said, I said, Ali, I said, don't say that. So help me God. I said, Ali, don't say that. I, I felt offended that as great as my brother is, he would say over and again, still a nigger, brother. <laughs> and you know what? Ali left my house, and a few months later, I caught on. I'm a little slow. I'm a little slow. What I think he was saying to me is, though I may be on a Wheaties box, though I may have endorsements, though I may be the most popular fighter in the annals of history, in their eyes, I'm still a nigger. You can be the best singing nigger, the best dancing nigger, the PhD carrying nigger, the right reverend doctor nigger. But in America, You never escape being what the masses of your people are.
Now, why is this? I've never heard a preacher greater than T.D. Jakes. I admire his preaching. Every time I can hear him on the television, I listen to my brother. I love Bishop Patterson of the Church of God in Christ. When I turn him on, I happen to just turn my dial, and if he's preaching, I don't, I don't turn it away. These are great preachers. Reverend Price, great preachers. You can preach till the cows come home. If we can use you, we'll use you till we use you up. Oprah Winfrey went out to California, saw a beautiful home, they tell me, that was on sale for $12 million. No, 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 my sister got paper. Long paper. And I'm very proud of her, I really love her. I love Oprah Winfrey because she is one of the sweetest souls you will find, but money has not made her whole. Money don't make a black man or woman who was a child of those brought across the Atlantic Ocean whole. Is there a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole? Is there a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul? Nothing that we have achieved has healed us as a people. Political office don't heal us. When you get there, you know you don't have any power. The power that you have is the power they allow you to have. And when you step over the line, they cut you off and leave you with nothing. Now listen, this don't mean that our politicians are not valuable. But it only means that they are not powerful enough to really make a change. They do the best they can, and they are valuable. Congressman Conyers is the one who brought legislation into the Congress, not to give us reparations, but just to study it. Just let's open up a dialogue about it. Let's, let's talk about it. The bill hasn't come out of committee, from what I hear. Is that true, Congressman? Well, damn. I gotta try to be civil. But if the government does not even want to study a problem as it concerns us, what are we going to do to get reparations? Reverend Al Sampson took them to court. Is that right, Reverend Al? What did the judge do? Threw it out. Why? The court is the brother of the robber, the murderer, and the thief, and the kidnapper. The court ain't going to give you justice. One brother will knock you down, and the other brother will come say, did my brother do that? My brother is so awful. Then later that night, you see him with his brother, talking about how they done in the nigga. Ain't no justice for us with that. That's why I got to talk about what God promises. Because right now, this question of reparations is the hottest thing that any black person could talk about. But why won't we talk about it? Because we want to go along to get along. We are slaves with a slave mentality who want the approval of white people rather than to confront them for justice.
If we keep talking about reparations, the smile is going to stop. The pat on the back, the hand will have a bat in it. Because if you press them too hard, they'll say, what you going to do about it? Them little pop guns that we sold you in the ghetto, just enough to get you killed. What you going to do about it? And all of us going to tremble when they roll the tanks in, because they got them ready. Armored personnel carriers, police now dressed like SWAT teams. What you going to do? What does God promise? The middle passage was a horror. Slaves packed like animals aboard slave vessels. Slaves shackled in pairs, the right arm and leg of one chained to the left arm and leg of another. Men were separated from women, but all were confined below deck and packed into slave quarters. These quarters were no more than six feet long and not high enough to allow an individual to sit upright. The conditions were miserable. Slaves were forced to lie naked on wood planks and many developed bruises and open sores. The unbearable heat below deck mixed with human excrement and vomit produced a terrible stench. The unsanitary conditions were breeding grounds for diseases like dysentery, smallpox, and measles. Slaves died from these diseases and many more died from malnutrition. Slaves were fed twice a day rations of fish, beans, or yams that were prepared in large copper vats below deck. And those who refused to eat, hoping to starve themselves to death, were force fed. The slave women were many times the subject of abuse and rape by the ship's crew. There were many slaves who attempted to escape by hanging or starving themselves to death or jumping overboard. This does not include the untold whippings and beatings that the slaves endured to keep their fear high in order to limit the opportunity for mutiny. Those of us that survived the Middle Passage, they don't want to talk about how you got robbed of your name, your language, your culture, your religion, your God, and your history. That's a subject they don't want to deal with. And that's why they marked the time of our arrival to 1619. The informative information presented in this video is motivational and is positively aimed at inspiring, educating, and entertaining the viewers with the cutting edge of critical reasoning. If you enjoy the contents on the Black Radar YouTube channel, Please consider subscribing to show your support.